Today we have ISTJs versus INTJs. And so Ryan, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Hey, I'm Ryan. Uh, I'm a personality blogger. I type on practical typing with uh, my partner, Mara, um, and I am an ISTJ. Cool. And Chris? Hey, everyone. I'm Chris. I run the YouTube channel, Asara Psych. Um, I'm a certified MBTI practitioner and a graduate student of psychology. Excellent. And so, Laura? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Laura. I'm ISTJ. I was on the ISTJ panel on Joyce's channel a few weeks ago. And I'm also a six wing five self pres social in the Enneagram. Very cool. And Michael? Yeah, Michael, INTJ, uh, five wing four in Enneagram. I have a YouTube channel is called Countertype. And I'm going to I'm going to embarrass Joyce by saying happy birthday, Joyce. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm practicing my FE. So there you go. I'm feeling your FE. <laughs> Good function development, Michael. <laughs> so great introductions, everyone. Just to reiterate, Ryan has a website called Practical Typing, Azure Air Psych, and Michael have YouTube channels that you should totally check out. They'll be provided in the links below. They have excellent content. Go check them out. They're very, very good YouTubers and website creators. And so I'm the boring person that doesn't have a channel or a website, but I'm hoping to have one in the near future. For sure. That's that's great. <laughs> and so the first chopping block for this discussion. So I was wondering about the possible differences between NI, which is the INTJ's dominant function, introverted intuition, versus the ISTJ's dominant function, which is SI, introverted sensing. And if we could compare and contrast these these two functions to see if we can see any similarities or differences. So this one actually is pretty interesting to me, mostly because I have actually not had a chance to talk to an INTJ about the way that they perceive their NI. Most of my information about anti dominance has actually come from INFJs. So I'm actually curious to see how using the TE and the FI in the middle kind of skews the way that you perceive your dominant function. I wonder how similar it actually ends up being to me. Because like for me, with my SI, it, it kind of, the way I view it is, it kind of is, basically I'm constantly pulling in information from around me. Like it's, like it never stops, if that makes any sense. I just, as I'm walking around looking at stuff, it's just like every second is just pulling in all this information and I'm deciding what to do with it. I'm analyzing it. I'm kind of storing it away and remembering a lot of what I see. And it, it's not even necessarily like super conscious, like I'm aware of it, but it's not like it's taking up all of my mental focus, but it's kind of weird because then I'll turn around and then later on, I'll end up replaying a lot of the stuff that I'd seen earlier that day or earlier the week. And that's kind of how SI works for me. It is an interesting one. I mean, the first thing I'll say is that it's the mistypes for INTJs a lot of the time are INTP and ENTJ. I think that something we can clear up here is how much we actually have in common with the ISTJ as opposed to the other, the other types. Because we're, I mean, we're the difference is we're perceiving dominant type. So I think there's actually more similarity than a lot of the um, a lot of the stereotypes and a lot of the general profiles would lead you to believe. So the way that Ryan, you just described it, I mean, I'm thinking that I, I, I do the same thing, except I, where, where I think it diverges for me is where you described going back over something that had happened and pulling out the detail and pulling out the, the information from the past experience. I'll go back, but I'll run through alternate experiences, you know, and I'll play things forward as well. I have a terrible memory for detail. I have a terrible memory for, for actual detail. And it's, it's like with NI, I feel like it's something that I need to sit down and, and just trust that something is going to be there because I feel like ISTJs are much more meticulous than I am. And I'm kind of envious of it. Like there, there's, there's a way of, of doing like, research in depth that the ISTJ um, is, the ISTJ really excels at. I have a really difficult time with that unless I know where something is going and I know like where to like, like intuitively what to reject and what to accept. So in terms of that going back over the past, going back over concrete detail, 
I don't have that. If I'm going back into the past, I'm running through something that didn't happen actually to try to extract more meaning out of um, whatever it is, if that makes sense. So for me, and I tends to be very um, kind of impressionistic in that um, kind of as Ryan said, it's almost like I'm searching for things. But for me, it's almost like when I'm out and about or I'm doing something, I'm seeking something that's going to inspire me. And I would say that that's the most satisfying thing for intuition for me is when I come across something that makes me want to dive deeper into it. I have a terrible memory for detail. I'm almost never looking back over something. I take terrible notes for school, things of that nature. I bullet point things, bullet point things and I use very um, associative learning styles um, when I'm interacting with new information because I can kind of quickly grasp the concept of what I'm working with. And as long as I can do that, then I can boil down everything that I'm interacting with and throw out the details and get the general idea. Um, so that's how it is for me. I'm constantly searching for those types of things where I can become inspired and then quickly reduce that thing to its core element. So I have a question. So, I mean, as far as the information that you're storing in your head, like this is probably going to be hard to explain, but how, how does that look for you with NI as a dominant function? Like for me, it's literally like I'm almost replaying stuff in my head. Like it's almost like watching a movie at certain times, depending on the situation. It's not always that way, but like I was re listening to something that I had listened to before today, for instance, and I hit a certain part in the audio and it literally took me back to the, when I was listening to it the first time, like I could remember exactly what I was doing, exactly where I was, exactly what I was thinking about the first time I had heard that same piece of audio. So I don't, do you guys have anything like that similar that happens to you or is it different with NI? Well, I'll, I'll just say as an ISTJ, I, I have the same kind of experience when I'm listening to audio. It, I can I can kind of replicate the the, the first experience when, when it happened. Yeah, where I was, what, what I was doing. Um, yeah, sometimes like like a song on the radio will will pop up, and then I'll kind of think like like oh yeah, when I last listened to that song, I, I was I was doing this or that. It, it, it's it's kind of weird. I would say that when when that happens for me, it's not often. Uh, and when it when it does, I would connect it to introverted feeling more than anything else. It's more of a feeling. It's nothing to do with specifics. If my memory sort of, if I'm sent back to a past experience when it happens, it's very spontaneous and it's very random experiences. It's literally things like driving down a road at a certain time, listening to something on the radio that has no connection or any sort of significance that I can draw from it. It's actually very strange. That happens a lot for me. And if I'm in a situation where I'm, say, at home and listening to a song, it's not going to connect me to any sort of memory, but I will play out alternate scenarios. I mean, whether it's a problem that I'm trying to figure out or a situation that I'm in that I'm trying to figure out how to get through, or in an embarrassing way, just like having fun being someone else in my in my head, <laughs> basing around my kitchen and like playing out a life that's completely not my own. My experience is very similar to yours, Michael. I would describe... Um, and I, for me, as primarily like almost like being in a daydream like state where it's not like you're revisiting what you have experienced. It's more like you're playing out some sort of fantasy that hasn't existed. And I'm always I always tell people that I'm able to learn my life lessons without experiencing them because I'm able to play out those situations in my head. And if I know that that wouldn't work, I, you know, I, if I have a feeling that that social skill or that social situation wouldn't work out, then I'm not going to do that because that's hard, that's me looking and trying to solve through that problem already. And I think that's actually one of the weaknesses of maybe the INTJ is that maybe they think they might not be able to do something. So therefore, you know, lower slot SE, they're not going to do it because of that perception. I really relate to that description of NI too. Whenever I am, am replaying something, like it's never actually replaying what happened or what actually went on. It's it's me trying to get something more out of out of like like a deeper analysis of it, but I'm never I'm never going going through the memory again. The, once the memory has happened, it's happened and I don't really I don't really care to revisit it, but I I care about trying to extract something like an understanding from it without without going back to the actual concrete event itself. For me it feels like I'm evading the actual memory and I'm trying to like I'm interacting with something else when I'm 
when I'm going back into my memory. It's it, like, it's not even with the thing itself, but it's with this, what, what, what concept I got out of it. And then I'm trying to go deeper into it, but I'm evading what actually happened. I'm, I'm not recalling like the physical things that happened in association with that, like that, that is gone. I, I'm not going through that. What I'm going through is like the concept that it's sparking that those are the things that I go over again, the, the concepts that is sparked. I think that's really a great way of saying it, Joyce. And I had a discussion about this with an ISTJ a week or two ago when we were talking about the idea that like, when you listen to an INTJ versus an ISTJ tell a story, the ISTJ is usually going to find joy in explaining the story because they they enjoy maybe interacting with that experience that they've already had and reliving it in their head temporarily, if it's a positive experience, of course. And you're gonna find with the introverted intuitives that they're often trying to rush through the, the like past parts of their story. They're like, yeah, like I need to explain these details so I can get to the point, so I can tell you the point of the story and get there instead. Yeah, that, that's interesting that you say that because what, what it is coming from the SI side is I won't rush through the details because to me, the details are the point. So without the details, I feel like there's basically no point to the story because I found the meaning or the concept from the details itself. So when you guys talk about you kind of strip away all the, the details of a past experience and you don't really remember it, like all everything surrounding it, you're only looking to strip a concept or whatever else from it. Um, I'll look for concepts or things to take away from an experience, but when I'm doing that, I'm literally replaying the whole thing like a movie, kind of like I said before. I'll, I'll rewatch what happened. And then I'll analyze everything that happened and said, okay, well, what can I take away from this? What were the details? What were the significant factors that played into this? And what can I learn from it? Or what can I take away from it? What have, What's the lesson coming out of everything that happened? But for me, I need all of that detail and information to actually get a takeaway. Yeah, I think that, I think it's similar for, for myself. It's, it. I kind of play it, kind of play it like a movie, and I mean, yeah, I do focus like on like what I can take away from it, but then I'll also focus on the details because I think it's the individual details that that make a situation unique and different from another situation. Like the situation is different because it had these it had these details versus that situation which which had those details, and. I kind of wanted to add something about like, 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 like thinking of different scenarios because I, I will also think of different scenarios, but, but because my any function is inferior, I, you know, I always feel this uncertainty about which scenario is actually going to play out. So it's different from NI, which, which kind of, kind of looks at one scenario, like, like this is going to be the one that's going to happen. It, it's like, well, you know, for me, it's like X, Y, and Z could happen, but I'm but I'm never really sure exactly which one is going to happen. I can only kind of, I can only kind of guess and use a probability. So I'm wondering, Ryan, if you if you have something similar to that. Um. So so for me, if if I'm playing out scenarios, which which I do do that, um, it it's more along the lines of I'll be basically looking at everything that might happen. I'm, I'm not necessarily trusting myself so much to be able to narrow it down to this is definitely going to happen. I'll have more of a, this is probably going to happen. But in the event that this is not what's going to happen, I have this and this also that I'm prepared for just in case it skews to the left or the right, or if there's some other thing that plays into it that I didn't account for. So um, I'll have an idea of what I think is going to happen, but then I basically have a bunch of back checks because I'm not going to guarantee, I'm not going to basically bank on myself being right. Yeah, yeah, it's similar for myself. It's kind of, kind of like, well, I'll think about these different scenarios. I will, I will plan for the worst case scenario, but I'll hope for the best. So I think there's, I think there's a, there's a couple things that this makes me think. So Ryan, going back to your point about the going through the details and and working through the details to find meaning or substance. I think with NI, there's like, there's a kind of leap of faith that we have to make that it's going to sort itself out. So like when, when I have a lot that I'm, that I'm working through or I need to process, I'll, um, 
I have to trust that it's working itself out in the background. And when there's really a lot going on, I'll find myself sleeping more, like checking out more mentally, uh, having more dreams, honestly, like wh while that stuff processes in the background. If I sit down and try to work through the details of something and try to try to force that, or even if I sit down and do something else, which is try to do like what I call fake TI for myself and try to like, you know, lay things out in a TI kind of way, it never serves me well. And it's, it just, it just wipes me out. And I have to, I have to trust that it's working itself out in the background. And then eventually that, you know, some insight is going to rise from that. The problem is when there's a ticking, when there's a clock ticking, and then you got to get into TE real quick to like, to, to make that thing happen, you know? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's definitely not really background. Like, whenever I'm trying to get like a takeaway from something, I'm, I'm very aware of it happening. Like I can still do other stuff while it's happening, but it's definitely, I, I can basically, uh, I, I can basically feel the wheels turning. And I, if I check in back with my mental processing, I, I can really, I can watch it real time what's happening. Like, so it's, it's not really background like you're describing. So I, I think that's pretty much, where it kind of skews is if you were to say that we were doing the same thing it, for you would be probably more subconscious, so to speak. And then for me, it's probably a little bit more right in the forefront of my head. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's also more conscious. And I mean, I feel like I don't have, I don't like to just take on faith that, you know, that something that this is working out, this is going right. It, it, it's kind of like I need to see the, I need to see the facts, you know. I need to see the data, the, the proof that it is actually working. My question for the ice TJs is: When you're replaying a memory, does it feel like you're reliving it? Like, does it feel like you're there when you're replaying it? Do you feel all the emotions associated with that memory when you replay it? Like when you replay the movie? Yes, yes, and no. I mean, I think I definitely kind of replay it like a movie, and. But I may or may not, you know, feel the emotions because it depends on how much the memory emotionally impacted me to begin with. So if it was something that strongly impacted me emotionally, then then yeah, I'm going to be more likely to feel the emotions with it. If it's if it's something that didn't impact me as much, I may not feel as much emotions, but I can I can still I can usually I can still usually recall most of the details. For sure. I guess my question is also like, to what extent do you relive a memory? Like how vivid is it? I mean, it, I mean, it kind of depends. It kind of depends on, on the memory. I mean, I mean, the more impact the memory had on me, I mean, you know, probably the more vividly I'm going, going to remember it. So, I mean, with my most vivid memories, I mean, I can kind of, you know, you know, literally picture it in my head, it, the setting, where I was at the time, what I was doing, what, you know, what, what was being said. And, th and then some other memories that maybe didn't impact me as much, it, it might be, it might be a little more vague, it, it might be, it, it might be more impressionistic, a little, uh, well, like just a vague impression. Like, I mean, I may know it, it happened at roughly this time, but it may not be as may not be as specific or or I know it happened at this place, but but maybe I don't picture the scene as much. So have you ever like watched footage of somebody else playing like a first person shooter? Yeah. It, it's basically that concept. So if you were to watch like somebody playing Call of Duty and you had that first person view and you can kind of see the cameras whipping around, um, for me, I would say that there's not so much a whole lot of emotion attached usually when I'm repaying the memory. It's, it's mostly an analytical thing for me. I'm usually replaying the footage to get more details because it's kind of weird because I frequently take more detail out of a scenario upon a rewatching than my initial impression of it. So the first time when I actually had the real physical experience with something, I'll take away some details um, depending on how much attention I'm paying to it at the time and if I actually need to take a bunch of details away from it. But when I replay it in my head, I frequently end up actually pulling more details out of it the second time through than the first time I had an experience with it. 
but it's kind of like it's like a camera that's kind of out of focus on the edges so whatever i focus the most intently on will be pretty clear but if I want to like look to like the left or the right to kind of like, oh, well, what was that over there? Why am I not seeing that clearly? If I didn't get a clear picture of it the first time around, it, it'll be hazy. Like I might know there was something over in the corner, but I never actually got a chance to get a good look at it. So I don't know exactly what it was, but I'll, I'll have a kind of sense of knowing that it was there, but it won't be clear or that kind of thing. Do you I, have I don't a think that of... really happens to me. I mean... I mean, if I, if I didn't get much details the first time, th then I'm certainly not going to get any more details. I'm certainly not going to get any more details later. Do you have a sense of being connected to it? Do you have a sense of uh, nostalgia about it or loss? Or is it comfort that you feel from it just in general when you think of your memory? Because I feel totally alienated from the person that I was in the past. Um, most of the time it's, it's kind of third person and detached for me. I mean, unless it was like a very significant or special event, then maybe there will be emotion attached to it. Like, you know, your first date or your first kiss or, you know, something, something that's like impactful or significant that FI is going to tie something to. But in my normal day to day, I'm, I'm usually pretty detached from any replaying of memory. It's more, like I said before, it's more of an analytical thing. Like I'm brushing back over it to comb more details out or to get some kind of takeaway from it. It's interesting because yeah, I, I think it's similar for me. I, I think yeah. it's, I think, it, you know, it's mostly analytical, but, but, but if it emotionally impacted me in some way that there will be some emotions attached to it. And, 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 and I do feel, you know, like, like some nostalgia for, for, for past things in my life that, that did impact me in, in some significant way. I, I do experience that. Because it's it's strange because I feel third person in my just present like <laughs> a lot of the time I feel I feel like I'm walking around like there's a third person kind of feeling, and then when something bubbles up or I'm reflecting back on something, it's very strange for me because it feels first person, but I also feel alienated from it. Like I feel I feel connected and removed from it at the same time. Past is kind of a strange kind of I don't want to say nightmare, but just a strange kind of. Um, Thing when it comes up. I, I don't quite know what to do with it. For me personally, related to that, like nostalgia is, I would even describe it as a feeling that I don't really have. Like I was talking to a friend the other day and he was like, oh man, I remember back when we were playing in high school and you know, everyone was playing on Xbox at the same time. I really missed those times. And I was like, can't relate. Like I don't, I don't <laughs> if, it, if it, it it's already passed, it doesn't really matter to me. And, I, and it's almost to the extent where I would say like, I don't even usually feel regret over things because if I've messed up in the past, that's a lesson for me to use for my future. So I don't dwell on things in the past um, unless I, I would say almost never. It's just not something that I ever find myself reflecting or worrying about. I, I've had a, a few other like um, SCNI people on that axis say that like regret isn't something they experience because I think like S people on the NI SC axis are kind of like forward momentum type of people. Like, um, like Michael said, the past doesn't matter. And it really feels that way for me too. Um, in, in a sense, like I'm detached, not only from my past memories, but I'm kind of detached in general, even like right now, like I feel like a third person to myself because I feel like um, I'm more of a, a vessel to to comprehend concepts more deeply rather than I feeling like an actual person in an actual body. But that's maybe a Joyce thing too. <laughs> I agree with what Chris said about the the feeling, um, not feeling regret, but but when that kind of feeling comes up for me, it's it's um, a feeling of of regret or shame or whatever it is. It's not connected to the thing that happened. It's connected to a feeling that I could possibly feel like this again, and I want to avoid that. So that's a that's a place where I don't I don't like getting stuck there. That's an unhealthy place to get stuck because that's how I can get stuck in a feeling because it's not it's not I'm stuck in that feeling and I'm stuck in that memory of that experience. It's that that can happen again. So I need to do everything to avoid the possibility of that happening again, which could be just total paralysis in like the worst the worst case. Yeah, I yeah, I relate to that. I relate to that 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 as well. Um I mean, I think I do I, I think I do have more memory of, uh, you know, 
uh, my past be, being an SI dominant. And, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to just forget anything that happened in the past because, I mean, I mean, for me, it, it, it's like my identity is sort of shaped upon all these past events that, that happened to me. And, and, and it kind of reflects who I, it kind of reflects in a way who I am right now. It's kind of like an accumulation of all the experiences that I've had. And then I can use that information to kind of help extrapolate out and extrapolate out into the future and then kind of see where I want to go, what, what direction I want to go in. And, you know, if there was something in the past that I wished didn't happen, well, then I can kind of use that information to make a different decision and avoid it from happening again. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with what Laura's saying there. It's, it's not, nostalgia is kind of a weird word for me personally, because I mean, I wouldn't say that I feel like I'm very nostalgic in the traditional sense of the word. Um, like I, I kind of more related to Chris when he was talking about the whole Xbox thing. I mean, I, I don't tend to go, oh man, I wish things were the way that they used to be kind of thing. Personally, I mean, I'm sure there's some ISTJs that do do that. But um, for me, I'm mostly focused on either the present or where I'm going for the most part. Um, it's mostly short term, though. So I'm, I'm either focused on, OK, I'm getting to where I want to be like now or I'm at where I want to be. And I want to make sure that I stay where I'm at kind of thing versus a I wish I could go back to the past. I really feel like going, the whole notion of wanting to go back to the past, I think is more of a unhealthy SI trait, kind of a longing to go back to the things the way they were kind of thing, I think is kind of a, it's a dwelling state. So it's kind of an unhealthy um, kind of rudimation because you can't go back to what once was unless you plow forward and make the future similar to the past. So even if you're going to do that, you have to look to the future to recreate the past versus rudimenting about the past itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 th that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's one, I mean, you can have warm feelings, obviously, about like holidays, you know, and, and those kinds of feelings and then reproduce those, you know, that's what that, I, I know a lot of ISTJs and ISFJs who sort of that stuff, honestly, I have to. I really have to fake it when it <laughs> when those things come up. Like I don't I don't get much out of out of them. Um, and with nostalgia, yeah, if you, if it's a situation of being stuck there, I have INFP friends who have that issue who will really retreat into that space, which is not something that I see with SI dominance necessarily. I would think that with like SI, I almost think people over talk about the like association of SI with the past. And I want to say it's almost more like SI is focused on like a homeostasis type of thing where they want to like preserve the feeling that they had or the kind of sensory experience related to the thing that was enjoyable in the past. And it's less so that they're trying to like go back to that in a healthy state, as you were saying, Ryan, but more so that they want to kind of preserve or maintain that thing for the future so they can keep having that positive experience. Right. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly how, how it is for me. Yeah, because I mean, I'm not going to be attached to something in in the, in the past that 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 that's no longer working. Like maybe it worked well in the past, and, and it doesn't work and it work now. So I, I'm not very traditional in in that way. Because if it's if it's no longer working, I can be quick to to discard it. But if it if it but if it was something that that that's worked well and 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 I've always enjoyed it, and I still enjoy it, then then it's something I'm gonna want to try to keep. Ryan, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, um, the last, the last panel I was in, I kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, so when it comes to the holidays and the traditions, um, I, I didn't keep any of the ones that I grew up with. Um, I, I'm kind of like Michael in the sense that I didn't get a ton out of it. Um, I mean, the traditions were shaped around an ISFJ rather than an ISTJ, which I mean could very well have a lot to do with that because it was a lot to do with kind of the atmosphere and the feeling of the whole thing. And I mean, to me, it looked a lot like a ton of effort for not that much payoff. So I, I personally didn't find it super worth it. So what I ended up doing was I, I just basically extracted the couple things that 
I actually really enjoyed out of those experiences. And, and that's the things that I kind of took with me. So, I mean, I like the food from the holidays, so I replicated that. But I mean, other, other than that, I like the decorating and the making everything festive and the people being over and all that stuff. It's like, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't the stuff that made me satisfied, I guess, more or less for lack of a better word. So that's things that I just didn't end up taking with me. Yeah. It, it's kind of similar with, with myself. I kind of only took a, I kind of only took a couple things from, from, you know, how I celebrated the holidays when I was growing up. It, yeah. It's kind of like, you know, yeah. I, yeah. Some of the foods, foods are the same, but, but it's just selected foods and, and, and I typically don't bother with, with the decorations. Um, and, and then like, like visiting people, it, it's probably just a, a select number of people and, you know, not, you know, not, not everybody that, that was, that was before. That's really interesting. Would you say like for the INTJs then there's, if SI is homeostasis, then is, 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 is NI in the first slot feel like an indifference to homeostasis? Yeah. So there's kind of an interesting point with this that I was having a discussion with with somebody a while back. And I think one pe one thing that people tend to forget is that as an introverted perceiving type, introverted intuition also kind of enjoys similarity in some sense, but it's going to be more so that they're enjoying the similarity related to the ideas that they enjoy. I mean, look at most INTJs who have like a YouTube channel, they're focusing on one topic and they're, you know, they've been researching that topic for years. Yes, that's the same thing, but they're researching the same thing related to a concept. So, um, I know for me, I enjoy like similar things, but I often enjoy trying new angles at that similar thing. Um, say, for example, like if I go out to eat, I usually enjoy the same two or three restaurants, but I'm usually going to try something new each time I go. It, it's those small types of things where you're trying to narrow down what you enjoy in these things that you enjoy, but also experience new things within them, for me at least. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's kind of similar for, for me, actually, like I've like I have an interest in in personality typologies, so so it's kind of like I like to explore new angles within within personality theory, and and kind of see, for example, like like, like different YouTube channels. You know, they might all talk about cognitive functions, but but it's kind of interesting to get um, people's different angles on the cognitive functions and. And I mean, and kind of the same with restaurants as, as well. Like, yeah, yeah, I'll kind of tend to the same few restaurants, but then I will, I will, you know, maybe try new things w within those restaurants, or, um, you know, until I find like, like, okay, um, th these are my favorite things from that restaurant, and then I might find myself, you know, sticking to those few favorite favorite things, but, but, but. But sometimes it's not until I know that those are my favorite things. So, a, a lot of that is TE for me. For me, when it comes to like the restaurants and everything, because I just want the most efficient way to just get something like that out of the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if it's if I have my five or six places that I'm comfortable with, I will you know keep that keep that list of five or six, and it's just like oh, just because I don't put much. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people like sitting in restaurants and the camaraderie and the meal and, and all of this. I, give me the check. Give me the check before, like deliver the check with the food. I want to be able to get out of here like as quickly as possible as far as I'm concerned. But maybe that's just an idiosyncratic thing for, <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it kind of depends on, it kind of depends on the purpose of, of going, going to a restaurant. Are you going there? for for the meal or are you going there more for the social occasion so i mean if i'm going there primarily for a meal then then yeah i'm gonna be yep i i just want the check you know i just kind of want to go in and out um you know if i'm going there you know with a group of people and then it's more about a more about the social gathering it, it, itself and then the, and, and then the food is kind of a secondary thing then then i'm not going to be as concerned about about the efficiency part of it. So, so, so yeah, it really, it kind of depends for, for me why, why I'm going to the restaurant. Yeah. And restaurants as a social, like, I mean, dining as, as a social, you know, engagement, 
there's too much going on. And maybe it's an SE thing, but there's too much going on. There's too many, there's too many moving parts. Like it, it's, I, I get, I get very distracted and I feel like I feel trapped and like, there's no escape um, in restaurants. Again, maybe, maybe just me mm -hmm. should see me in a dance club. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, definitely in, in, in a dance. Well, definitely in a, in a dance club or, or a bar. You know, I find those places too too noisy. There's like there's, there's too, too much, much stuff going around. On there, there's the, the music's too loud. There, there's too many people talking. You know, but 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 you know, it, 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 in a quieter restaurant, I typically don't. I'm typically not not very bothered by that. I can kind of I can kind of tune you know other things out more and then just kind of focus on focus more on the table that I'm at. So here's a question for the INTJs. Um, when you do experiment with getting like different food at a restaurant, what what level of disappointment do you end up being at if you basically experiment with something and you didn't like it or it was kind of meh? Like for me, it's it usually is kind of like, it kind of sours the whole experience for the most part. If, if I tried something new and I didn't like it, I'm like, well, that, that was a bust. I usually cheat the system. I get something new and then something I've, I've liked before. So <laughs> uh, that's my usual approach. I'll get like an appetizer that I know I'll like and then a, a new food for uh, dinner. But honestly, I'm usually not too kind of bothered by those things. Maybe when I was younger, I would get more bothered by them. Um, restaurants are a particular thing for me. And it's maybe it's because like I used to weigh like 300 pounds and I struggled with like food addiction for a while. Um, when I go to eat at a restaurant, my wife will say that I she loses me. Like I, I'm just so focused on food. Um, I just get lost in the meal and eating. And she's like, I can't even have a conversation with you. You're just so focused. I'm like, yeah, I like food. It's good. Uh, but. <laughs> I mean, I'll get, yeah, I just, I just let it slide when that happens. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me that much. Actually, even beyond that, if there's like, if I'm at, if there's any experience and I get bad service, bad customer service anywhere, uh, the food doesn't work out. They gave me the wrong thing. I kind of personally just accept that. I'm like, well, you know, you, I, I want to say you win some, you lose some, but like there are times when I got more than I expected and I didn't, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. appreciate that and realize that it's going to swing the other way sometimes and why, why cause a, a fuss about it. So really I just let it sort of, it's a good, it, it's sort of like driving and being, you know, dealing with someone cutting you off in traffic and just like, just being stoic about it. I've done that. You know what I mean? Someone yeah. almost someone almost mm. moved into my lane yesterday. Yesterday, do it. We were at a left light. She obviously didn't realize there were two left turns. She tried to come into my lane. She almost smacked the front of my car. I'm just like, I've done that. You know? Okay, we're fine. And then she sped off because she didn't want to make eye contact or something, because she was embarrassed. And I'm like, it's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay, so my dad is an ISTJ and how he deals with disappointment is he has a hissy fit. So it's either like <laughs> like he'll he'll really go like this is why we shouldn't have changed things, Joyce. We should have just done it the way that works. <laughs> and then <laughs> every time it goes like poorly and he's like it sours the whole experience for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean I think I was more like that maybe in my childhood. I, I'm not really that way now. I mean it's like if I order something in a restaurant and it's not as good as I hoped it would be. I mean, it's just kind of like, okay, yeah, you know, it's a little bit of an annoyance, but but it's just not a big deal in the whole scheme of things. You know, the worst thing that happened is I, I, I lost out on a little, little bit of money. Um, I just, you know, I can get something different next time. I mean, you know, you know, somebody cuts me off in traffic. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, life is too short to to be worked up over something like that, unless, you know, somebody is, you know, truly driving dangerously on the road and actually, you know, endangering people, you know, then, then it might be more of an, then it might be more of an issue, but yeah. I mean, I mean, service in a, a restaurant, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, people do make mistakes and, you know, I work in, I work in customer service, not, not in a restaurant, but, you know, I mean, I mean, sometimes you, you, you hear the other person, other person wrong or, 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 you know, somebody switches the tables. I mean, you know, things like that just happen. I mean, it's not a personal thing really, you know, it's just. <laughs> yeah, that that's, that's true. So Ryan, I believe, um, so with that question that you asked, uh, were you trying to get at like with SI, if a, if a current experience doesn't match like a past experience, it experiences like a certain type of disappointment and you're like seeing if INTJs go through that too. Like, um, like SI kind of 
like past experience set a benchmark for you know how to judge like current experiences and if the current experience like falls flat it can like kind of like sour your experience of it or if that makes sense <laughs> yeah so i mean so to pull up an example um there there are select places that i do like to go out to eat it's it's honestly very rare for me i'm i'm not as i'm not super into eating out just on a personal level so honestly i'm most of the time getting drugged to a restaurant unless i'm in like a very particular mood and if i'm in that mood i know exactly where i want to go and what i want um but my one friend she likes these like kind of i don't even know how to describe it but they're kind of like foo-foo places to eat that basically it's really expensive and they give you like this much food and anytime i go to a place like that it, it's just like a complete drag for me because it's like i paid way too much for this plate of food and they gave me way too little for what what i paid for and it doesn't even taste that good so what was the point why am i here <laughs> and, and it's that kind of thing that i think maybe that's more on the si side than the ni side maybe because for me it's it's all about ratios it's like was this worth it for like the cost to effect or the cost to enjoyment or the the effort that it took for me to go do the thing was it worth it and then if it wasn't worth it that's usually where it ends up kind of being not it's not that i even throw a hissy fit about it so much but it, it it's like a minor annoyance so when things don't pan out in that kind of way it, it makes me kind of irritated i mean i need this is sort of tangential to this i think but i i honestly need to be in a relationship to like enjoy things because i need to i need to be like not dragged around but like to it's strange just just being with someone because in my life like me single i am just a complete i turn into this like efficiency machine in kind of a pretty pretty dry pretty stale way i will go to the same place every day. I will get, I will eat the same thing every day, every single day. And I'll be fine with it because I've got a list of things that I'm doing and I'm very focused on that. I need to be taken out of that, out of that place because I can completely withdraw and like eventually sort of not enjoy anything, get quite a bit done, but not really enjoy anything. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, you know, Michael, now that you've stated that you're single, you know how many people are going to hit on you <laughs> in the comment section? <laughs> and yeah, so a lot of the, the talk here is also like an IJ trait too. I noticed it especially with ITJs, but like there's a saying that like IJs like their IJ box. And so what you guys are talking about is that like you guys you know, like to go over like, I don't know, you, you guys like kind of stay in a little bit of sameness unless, and, and like a uh, consistency, unless someone like forces you out of your box, forces you out of your IJ box, which is what it sounds like. I wanted to kind of continue on what Michael said there with like, you can force yourself to do these same things, but it's not even because you really enjoy doing these same things. Like when I went on my, my weight loss journey, I ate the same thing like six days out of the week. I would go to the work and I'd go to Subway and I'd get the exact same sandwich. And it wasn't because I enjoyed it or wanted to repeat this process. It was because the goal of weight loss was greater than my personal experience. So I decided that, oh, if I do these exact things every single day, then I will be able to reach this goal. And that's what worked for me. So you're kind of able to sacrifice in enjoying the present moment for, for a greater reward in the future. Is that kind of my understanding of it? Um, yeah. And I would say that I'm almost always willing to sacrifice like a personal pleasure if it will benefit me greatly uh, towards the thing that I'm really looking forward to doing or achieving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I actually relate to that as well. I would attribute that a bit to T and also a bit to being a judger too. Cause um, I, I can to some extent relate to that too. Like I'm, I, I can sacrifice the means if it's like a ends and like judges are known for like long, like thinking in terms of long-term. So they're like, judges are, are known for, for being end, end focused. Whereas like FE is more like social harmony focus, which is an ends, right? And TE has a, has a logistical ends that it's aiming for. And so it, it, it seems like that's what's being explained right now. Like the, the, ease, the ease with, if you're working towards a goal, the goal matters more than your pleasant, your present enjoyment 
of that thing. I'll also, if I'm being honest, I'll be living some sort of yeah, life I'll that's a lot more fun in my mind, you know, like at, <laughs> at the same time. So that that's also going on. And there's actually that that's that's actually extremely vivid for me. But if you think about it, I mean, for, for INTJ is obviously, you know, you you take an ESFP and like how they go about living their lives, you just flip that upside down. That's sort of what we're describing right now. But at the same time, those same kinds of drives are still in us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a tension there where you can't, I will tend to lean more toward the very IJ sort of that thing that we're describing now too much. And a lot of time goes by, you know? Yeah. And so I'm wondering how our inferior function uh, influences all of this. How does inferior and E extroverted intuition in ISTJs look different from extroverted sensing SE in INTJs in, in the fourth slot? So I, I have a theory. Um, so, I mean, th this is probably going to be a little bit anecdotal, but it almost seems like an inferior NE vice is going to be something more akin to like gambling versus a inferior SE vice might be more like a sensation type thing, like an overindulgence in like food or, or drugs or something like that. Because with the inferior NE, if, if you go in a bad direction with it, it's a what could be. So when gambling, it's a I could win. So I'm almost wondering if the inferior NEs may have more of a tendency to fall for a vice like gambling versus inferior SE might go more for a vice like overindulging in food or, or getting hooked on drugs possibly or something like that. I mean, obviously there's always overlap. Obviously there's INTJs that can get addicted to gambling and there's ISTJs that can get addicted to drugs or food or whatever else. But I'm kind of wondering if there's trends in either direction like that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, Chris I, was I'm talking not, about really overindulging sure. in food. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Laura. Um, so I didn't mean to interrupt. I mean, I yeah, I, I don't know many other. I don't know many other ISTJs to say for sure. I mean, well, like it hasn't really been my experience because I I, I don't. I don't resort to gambling and, and, and I don't overindulge either, but, but that's not to say that other ISTJs wouldn't, wouldn't gamble because I mean, I have, I mean, I think for me, my inferior NE is kind of more like I'm overwhelmed by all these possibilities. I don't know. I don't know which one to follow. I don't know which one is correct or, or it could be just, catastrophizing into a worst case scenario about something. Um, so for me, it, it, it's not so much about taking taking a huge risk in gambling, but I have read in some inferior any descriptions that there are there are people that that will that'll do that. They'll all of a sudden take a huge risk in their life or they'll, they'll all of a sudden, you know, you know, move to an all of a sudden like a, like an impulse, they'll move to another country or, or make some major life changing decision that, that that would normally be uncharacteristic of them but they're but when they're in the grip of the inferior they may they may be really impulsive like that yeah and i was going to say just jumping off of what ryan said too that chris was was talking about his situation and i i've been hooked on drugs in the past so i mean you hit on the two sort of like precisely what the no. what the issue is and i think in terms of i mean i don't know if chris you agree but i feel like the the for INTJs, our saving grace is also can be our downfall in these kinds of situations when we fall into that because we can go very, very long balancing and managing those kinds of things and not falling deep into it and be very, being very functional. So that at a certain point, if you keep doing that, physical things take over and eventually you're out of control. You know what I mean? So we'll go, I think, longer than most in being able to balance those things and think that everything's fine, I've got this under control. And then eventually, if if some sort of if if physical addiction takes over, that it's going to drag you way down because that's where you want to be in the first place. Just to sort of let go, I don't care about anything anymore. And it's also just now you've got now you, now you're being you know through through a sort any sort of addiction pulled down into it, and you can really get dragged down really far. 
that's really interesting that you mentioned that, Michael, because I, I do think that the introverted intuitives almost tend to be overly concerned with the negative impacts that they have with extroverted sensing. So they will do their best to kind of manage it. But then they, I always say that, whereas the extroverted sensing dominant type is more likely to fall into addiction, the extroverted sensing inferior type is more likely to fall into binging habits, where they're likely to every once in a while overindulge in something to a point where it's not very good. And you can actually see evidence of this when you look in the MBTI manual, because both of the introverted intuitive dominants were very likely and statistically to struggle with alcohol, but they were one of the least likely types to seek help for alcoholism because they felt that they had control over it. That is so fascinating. <laughs> I have a binging problem yeah, too. It's interesting. But, yeah. yeah. Um, and and so, so to your point, Ryan, uh, my ice TJ dad um, has a lottery lottery card problem. He likes to, to do lottery cards because he's like, I, I could win. Oh, <laughs> so I mean, that's one point for your theory. I wonder. So Ryan, you mentioned before that you know you feel like a high stress person, and so I was wondering if you know that inferior NE like that possible gambling maybe is like to, for ISTJs to relieve stress because they're of that stress. <laughs> um, it, it's possible. Um, I mostly brought that up because I have a coworker that I strongly suspect to also be an ISTJ and she also does the same thing with the lottery cards. I, I don't personally gamble. Um, I don't personally see a point in it. Um, my any vice would probably more be on the end of, gosh, I don't even really know. I mean, I, I tech, I, I usually keep myself pretty locked down and under control. So usually my inferior any comes out in the, in the grip state. So when that I, I go into basically everything's going wrong kind of mode. So I, I get less of the kind of, um, can't think of the word. I less of the milder inferior any stuff it seems, but it it sometimes will come out more in the the high stress way, where the inferior any will kind of all of a sudden just all at once go. There's so many different things to worry about, and I got to worry about this, and I got to worry about this, and I got to worry about this, and that's I feel like sometimes is where a lot of the stress for me comes from is because you know you just kind of push push that down so much and ignore it for so long. And then all of a sudden it just all kind of comes to the surface. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely really relate a lot to that. I was going to say it's not SI dominant, but my father who I'm pretty sure is an ESFJ. Um, he, for as long as I've known him, he plays the, I think it's the Powerball every day where you submit a set of numbers. Um, and that's kind of just been like his daily thing. He just buys one every single day, but he always, the numbers he always uses are his children's birthday. Um, so he switches between all of our birthdays. And I was like, oh, that's such like an S-I-N-E thing when you use it in that context that you just described it as. I think you do. I mean, it's just, just to say that as you as you get older, I mean, you you integrate these things more. And you get, I'm, I'm so much more comfortable with my, I don't even like calling them inferior functions with my lower stack functions now, having been through like, like to the, to the other end of that, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, I, there's a comfort in not going through that experience and anybody who's going through that experience should seek help. It took me too long to seek help. Like Chris was saying, I mean, there's every, every fiber of your being is resisting that. It's like, because you want to be able to say, I've got this under control, you know? But at the same time, having seen what that is, then you you sort of let go a little bit, and you you know as you have more experience, you get more and more comfortable with these so-called inferior functions. It just doesn't come naturally. I know a lot of really really quirky, interesting <laughs> ISTJs. I got to say, <laughs> you know, who like who like especially especially older ISTJs really settle into that NE. I think, and it's really it's it's fun to see. And I think they're like, I, I love those friends of mine, you know? Yeah. And, and that's definitely another way that yeah. the, the NE comes out. Right. So you, like for me in, in a, in a more positive, healthier light, when, when my inferior NE comes out, I, I, I dabble in music. So it, it kind of comes out in that I, I kind of like just, thinking about random 
just like tying random things that just make no sense together sometimes. And as a third person, a lot of times the people around me find it amusing when I get in a kind of a rare mood when I'm doing something like that. Yeah, I have an, an ISTJ yeah, co yeah. I used to work with them for a few years. Um, and I always liked conversation with them because we'd be talking and in most of the time he'd be in kind of like a sensing state, but all of a sudden every now and then he'd hit me out of left field with some like really in funny, like intuitive thought or joke. And it just, it would kill me because I don't know, extroverted intuition is like one of my favorite functions to interact with. So when you see it come out from those people who don't usually present it, it's even more exaggerated or funny in my opinion. Oh yeah. 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 Because, because it's like, you're not expecting it. So then you get that element of, of surprise. It's like, <laughs> You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I mean, I mean, people will like my friends tell me you have a wonderful sense of uh, sense of humor, and and usually I'm pretty, you know, pretty quiet and serious most of the time. But then, but then I, I definitely have this silly switch that you know when I'm in, when I'm comfortable and when I'm in the right state of mind that can come on, come on, and and yeah, I mean, just kind of putting putting like random things together that, that, that you don't think would think would go together. And, and then it's kind of funny. And, 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 you know, sometimes I like to make, make, make bad puns on the spot or, um, or sometimes, sometimes I find humor in taking something to its literal extreme, like humor from being like overly literal, kind of to the point where it gets kind of absurd. I don't know if you relate to that, Ryan, or you know ISTJs that, that do that kind of thing. I also think there's like a, there's a kind of world weariness between our two types that we share so that when that humor comes out, it can be pretty, <laughs> it can be pretty dry and, and sardonic, you know, that's uh, a good connection point for us. Definitely. So I have a question. So when it comes to like a, a future planning type thing. So I, I kind of mentioned already that any will cause me when it comes to the future. Sometimes I'll be thinking I'll kind of get like overwhelmed with all the what if scenarios. And sometimes I'll feel like I'm just getting overwhelmed with that. Is there a similar thing with SE or would you say it kind of comes out a little bit differently? Like maybe like a just ignoring of the future altogether kind of thing or how does that manifest? One thing comes to mind when I think about that. Um, for me, usually, I actually don't really like ever stress the future. Like if I'm presented with a problem, my mindset like 95% of the time is it'll be fine. Like I'll figure it out some which way, I'll use some sort of resource. For me, the problem is when I'm presented with a more immediate issue that I don't know how to deal with, um, especially if it's something that I hadn't previously prepared for. Um, I know a few, like a month or two ago, a hurricane rolled by and it was storming all around and I live in the woods. And I remember like, I was like trying to figure out what I should be doing right now. It was like in my house, like, should I go to the center of the house? Should I go get in my car and go somewhere else? What should I do? What should I do? And I didn't have an answer because I wasn't prepared and I wasn't thinking about this type of thing. Um, and usually it's, it's those types of things that I usually find myself not prepared for or stressing out over in a more, a more immediate issue. I totally relate to that. And I think, um, I don't get stuck at like worst case scenario kind of thinking because I, I, I try, I mean, I try to be confident in my sense that like, okay, here are the many ways that this thing can play out. Here are the most likely, let's be realistic. And knowing that in the past when I've been overly pessimistic over and over and over again, that it never played out that way. So it's like, there's a, there's a sort of reminder that you have to, that I have to summon every once in a while. Um, the only time where I'll get, and I think it's a different thing from what we stereotypically call inferior NE um, versus how I experience. If if there's a scenario that's very, very bad, but it honestly, realistically seems like the likely scenario, I won't get bent out of shape about it and I won't get anxiety over it, but I'll just, I'll, I will tend to get really just fatalistic about it. Like, is there nothing we can do to stop this? And maybe there's not. And then just sort of, shrug my shoulders and retreat into kind of an absurd sense of humor about something. I'm not very optimistic about the way just things are tending globally right now. You know what I mean? But it's, it's like, it's not, I don't get, I don't get bent out of shape about it. I sort of get, I, I just sort of feel just kind of detached and, and maybe a little sad about it. Yeah. That's interesting. 
as an INFJ, I, I also relate to the fatalistic thinking. Like if there is a most likely scenario and I see it like not heading well, like I tend to get kind of, it seems pessimistic to other people, but it's more like I see like the most clear reality that could happen and people aren't reacting to that. And so, yeah, fatalistic, I, I relate to that. <laughs> Maybe it's a certain brand of NI. And so takeaways, you know, both SI and NI have takeaways, but I think that they go about it differently. And so my theory on this is that with NI, it takes away the underlying meaning of things. Whereas like SI, it takes away the actual thing itself more. So like everyone does everything. That's my hypothesis. What are, what is everyone's thoughts? What do you take away from a scenario? Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I mean, I feel like I, I have con more conceptual takeaways. They're more, they're more abstract. They don't feel connected to the, the experience, but it's like, it's, it's something that can be mapped onto something else when, when I need it, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, typically for me, when I'm, when I'm coming up to a point where something's happened and I'm, I'm looking at it, I, I think you probably have it more or less right, Joyce, because I, it tends to be that I'll, I'll take away, well, this, this, and this happened, which means that, well, either I don't want to do that again, or I do want to do that again, or maybe that certain thing probably should be changed, that, those kind of things. And sometimes, depending on what I'm looking at, those mechanics can be taken and used in similar scenarios, or it can be used in a more broad sense. But I think most of the time I'm taking more specific takeaways, like it'll work in, um, I'll apply this knowledge to something that's the same or similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I kind of, I think I kind of do do the same thing. I, I mean, I mean, I'm kind of doing, I think I'm doing kind of like a combination, uh, combination of the, the two because I will take away some key concepts or, or, or patterns, but then I'm also taking taking away, you know, specific details, details too, and, and asking myself how this could be applied to, to similar situations. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of, I guess it kind of, for me, it kind of depends on the context of the situation to what exactly I'm going to take away from it. Yeah, it's interesting. With NI, its takeaways generally start more holistically, whereas SI, its takeaways start off more specific. And so, like, one of the ways, like, you can tell apart an SI or an NI user is an SI user, when they're recalling something, they'll they'll start with their own experience. So they'll talk from a point of their own experience with that thing, and then they'll expand outward from that. But NI starts with the holistic concept, and then it might, mm -hmm. it might go there, but it always starts off with like this thing that's not related to them, and then they'll go and then okay. make it more specific, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, that, that that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, because I, I think I kind of tend to tend to start with my own ex, my own experiences first, and then kind of go go more outwards. Yeah, so that's a possible differentiator. Uh, if you're talking to someone and you ask them about their thoughts on poverty, and then like um, or that that's a bad example, but <laughs> it's like okay, so you have like keep like with any topic, basically. I'm, what I'm saying is like with any topic, if you track, if you ask someone it, are they starting with their own experience first when they're answering the question? Or are they branching off from a place where they're like thinking about it abstractly first? Because like I notice INTJs start are more likely to start off with the abstract whole and then explain it. Whereas like if you ask an SI user something, they're more likely to start off with their specific experience and and then they'll explain it to you from that angle and then they'll branch out from there. So MBTI, like they say it's all about where you start that you can like branch out in whatever way, but like the most telling part of someone's type is like where they begin. So, yeah. There are a lot of arguments that would be a lot more fruitful uh, if people would understand, I think what you just explained about, you know, people coming from a different place, because it's not like, it's not like you, there's two people in an argument who are coming from a different place and they meet up right in the middle where they where they actually converge. It's that they're both over here 
in the margins still, and they're arguing about just just completely just from from different from different like existential premises, just based on like what the argument. And, and I think we're all having trouble describing this just because it's our dominant function. It just operates like a heartbeat. And it's it's like in the in the background, you know, it, it's so hard. I'm sitting here, I'm trying to find examples when I'm when I'm like trying to explain these things, but it's like it it just feels like it's everywhere. So it's like, do I just pick a random thing to talk about or like what? And then nothing comes up, you know. Well, it, it would be interesting to see. If, if Joyce did just pick a random thing to watch how all of us would come at it, and that would probably be a perfect example of how SI versus NI does it. But I, I definitely agree with what she's saying. Mm -hmm. I always usually tend, I, it's, it's kind of almost stereotypical in the sense that I almost literally sometimes start with, well, from my experience or from what I know or that kind of qualifier before I start into something when I'm giving somebody my take. That is super interesting. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and so my question for you all is, <laughs> okay, wait, wait, this, this might be a personality hacker themed question. Okay. So <laughs> how much do you think childhood plays a part in forming who you are? Does it play a huge part, a small part? How much can you tell about a person based on where they came from? Is it, I think the, the gist of the question. Like, how much can you infer well, it, from a person yeah, based well, on their well, past have, experience? Not my favorite question, but it's it's one. I think she was asking. I think she was asking about 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 the child. I'll use my SI here and say, um, how much how much of, of like who you are is based from your childhood? The way the personality hacker phrases is based on the family you grew up in. So I have an interesting anecdote about that. Um, a, a friend of mine knew um, this other family, right? So the father was a ESFP and he had a son, but he, the son never was around him. Like the, the mother split and she, she took the son with him. He had, he never met his father. He had never anything. And she met that son when he was 16 years old. And he was an ESFP. He was practically like a carbon copy of his dad. He had never met him before. And they had like almost exact same type mannerisms. They had like almost identical personalities. So based on my experience and what I have seen, I want to say that a lot mm -hmm. of personality is more genetic. It's genetic based. There, there might be yeah. possibly Nature. maybe some variants as far as Maybe you could flip the top two, depending on how you're raised. I, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I, I I would say my personal opinion on it is you're, you're probably born with a personality type, and it's, it's probably part mm -hmm. of your genetic makeup, and then it just depends on how you develop as a person is how your outside factors are going to affect that. Yeah, I think I'm inclined to to agree with that. I, I think that I, I want to say, like like nature probably plays a bigger role than nurture does, but but the the nurture part should not be neglected because because like, but like like if you have a good, you know, family up upbringing, um, you're probably going to end up being a much more psychologically healthy person than than if you you know, didn't have such a good family, family up, upbringing. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, I've read, read stories too about identical twins that were raised apart and, and then they show like some of the uncanny similarities that, that, that the two of them, that the two of them had. And I know Dave's superpowers from uh, objective personality. I mean, I mean, he's talked about like siblings and how, you know, how they're raised in the same, you know, same family and, and, you know, and how they can, they can end up being very, very different and they can, and then the two of them can interpret the family situation very differently, even if they were treated in very much, very much the, the same way, which kind of implies that, that there may be a high, high nature component to, to one's personality. But but I think that I think that said though I think one's childhood can can certainly influence like your self image for example like 
like like, like what you think of yourself, um, your, your self esteem, um, you know, you know, just how psychologically healthy you, you are in, you are in general, and uh, how well you you can develop it into your personality type. Yeah, I like to I like to imagine that there's more free play. I like to I like to. I'm more comfortable with the idea that it's more nurture over nature, but it's like there's the, the question overall is how much is determined overall, even beyond this. I mean, you extend this far enough and you're just into the, you know, is there free will kind of question? You know what I mean? Like all, like all of this stuff like spins out to, to <laughs> those kinds of considerations. I don't like, it feels like a prison to me, but I can't, like, I have no argument against it. You know, you can't play out the alternate history you know, except in your imagination, but then it's whatever, you know, you, you just can't do it. So who knows? Twins are interesting. If there are any twins in the crowd, get into the comments. Let us know what you think. Um, <laughs> twins, I'm fascinated by mm -hmm, just the, yeah. yeah, yeah, by, by um, twins. But I have two brothers, one's an ISTP, one's an INTP. We're all quite different, you know, but, where does that come about? I have no idea. Yeah. That's as deep into the SI as I'm going to go on the answer is just mentioning that I have two brothers and <laughs> those are their types. I think with, um, from, from like my perspective on type, I think in terms of personality type, um, I would, I would tend to agree with a lot of the ideas here that I think most of it tends to be um, nature or genetic. Um, I would say in my personal view, I tend to think of children in the first like three or four years of their life being within at the very least a quadra. So they have these four specific functions and then maybe the redefining uh, moments of their first few years of life could describe or pick which one's going to be the dominant function in some way. But I also think that nurture is going to have a huge impact into how those cognitive functions are going to be expressing themselves or whether or not they're going to develop healthily. Um, and then, of course, there's the argument that people have all the time, can trauma or personality disorders change cognitive function ordering? And we don't know that. You know, there's no formal research on that type of stuff. Um, but it is, it's a hard question to answer how much of your personality is going to be nature versus nurture. But from what we know in terms of psychological research and personality not related to MBTI, it does tend to be very much nature. I mean, babies have attachment styles, and that's something that tends to extend out to their romantic lifestyles when they're adults. So even at the age of two or three, babies have personalities that will generally go along with what they will be as an adult. And that, to me, that's interesting. Yeah. I think the real question, though, is is about the extent of function differentiation. Like, how much are those parts removed from the whole? Like, what you would what you would think of as like an ideal integrated personality, right? Because that a lot of that is is cultural, I think, and that's going back to Jung too. You know, where he quest Jung questioned how much is function differentiation a modern phenomenon? How much is it an internal an internalization of a kind of conflict? Um, so if, if the parts are there, then, you know, I, I think nature does play a big role, but the extent of the, really the conflict between them, I think a lot of that is cultural. I think a lot of that is nurture. So I think it's, it's both in a sense. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. just to add to that, I, I feel like talking about like personality as a whole, right? I feel like that is different than talking about like your your type. So I feel like there are definitely aspects of one's personality that can most certainly be affected by nurture, like what culture you grew up in, what kind of home life you had, and that's all going to play into the type of person that you ultimately become. Like your your four letter type is only a portion of your you as a person, right? Obviously, so I feel like there's definitely other factors at play that play into your personality in its entirety rather than just your type. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I totally agree with that. And because I think type is, type is like, you know, heavily based on, on cognition, like the cognitive function and your stacking. And that's kind of like, like how you process information naturally, but, but, but two people, the, the same exact type could, could still be doing, you know, still be doing very different different things with that information. So you can't just look at somebody's behavior and, you know, automatically assume their type from that. Yeah. 
And this yeah. is the problem with stereotyping too. I mean, one of the many problems is like, you don't want anyone to feel fated to not be able to do something, you know? And That's you can true. fall into that kind of fatalism with this, with, with this stuff. So there's, there's a point where there's like, there's a danger in, in not taking it too seriously because I think you should take it seriously, but I think it should be considered holistically and not, you know, as, you know, with, with, with that much differentiation. And just to say that I can't do this because I am X type. Yeah, that's true. Right. I completely agree. Like there, there's some sort of fascination I have like with type two, like there was a point in time where I was like, like how far can I rewire my brain? Like, like how far can I seem like a, like, like I, 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 I do see myself as an INFJ, but I was wondering if I tried my hardest to like gain perceiver like traits, what parts of me would change and what parts would stay consistent? Cause I kind of like, I, I like the idea of seeing how far you can push your type. Like, I think that I'll still stay in mm -hmm. INFJ no matter what, but I'm wondering if I were to try my hardest to adopt traits that were so unconventional by type, who would I become? Like, cause I, cause okay. My, and my reasoning for this is that like, I think that with, with type, there's a lot of barriers that we set on ourselves. Like we're like, oh, you know, a certain type can't do X, but I'm like, what if I tried my hardest to do X, what would happen? Like, would my brain just explode? Probably not. And then I'm like, so like, there's a fascination I have with pushing my brain to its limit. Where does the boundary lie? Like between like what you can teach yourself versus like what stays innate to your brain. And that fascinates me. <laughs> and I'm sorry, that's like, so the reason why this yeah. relates. To yeah, that, that's, a, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really know, but I mean, I think, you know, like any type can, can kind of do anything, but then yet I think we still maybe do it in a way that's, yeah conducive to cognitive functions. I mean, yeah. well, like, like any type could, could pursue any career or, or pursue any kind of hobby or sport, but you still may, you know, approach it in a way that, that kind of, kind of suits your, your cognitive function stacking. So yeah. like, see a bunch of like INTJs. INF so, so, so like, Sorry, like, like an INFJ, for example, could, could, could do maybe do something that's more, I don't know, more typical for ESTP or whatever, but maybe they'd be approaching it in a very NI plus FE way. And I mean, like, wouldn't yeah, that be such yeah. a fascinating case study? Let's all, just, let's all go free <laughs> it would solo, be, yeah. climb a mountain, you know, do some parkour. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how would you track all that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's definitely, it's an, it, it's an interesting thought. And I, I kind of almost mm -hmm. wonder if you can kind of see a little bit in that in say, in like acting, for instance. Mm -hmm. So some, some things that I've noticed is certain actors, I've noticed, I know what their type is, and then I see the role they're playing in a movie. And I'm like, I mm -hmm. see what personality they're trying to portray, but I'm also seeing mm -hmm. attributes of their actual real personality kind of bleeding through in the way that they're doing certain things. Like they'll do a certain action. It's like, uh -huh. but they're not say if it's an ENTP trying to portray like an ENTJ, they'll do an action, but they'll do it like a TIFE user rather than a TE user. And you're like, that's what a TE user might do, uh -huh. but he's doing that in more of like with kind of more of a TIFE attitude. And they kind of bring their yeah. own personality and, now, and that flair to it. That is mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. So, 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 so you kind of wonder, like, like if actors are the best at doing roles that are consistent with their own type or maybe a type, you know, very kind of similar to it that maybe uses the same cognitive functions, maybe just in a little different, different order. Um, rather than, you know, some other totally unrelated type that doesn't have any of the same cognitive functions in the main stack. And I mean, I mean, like, like, could I, like, if I was to act, like, like, could I pull off INFJ? Could I do it convincingly? Or would, would, I mean, I think for me, that'd be really weird. But I mean, you know, I mean, could I do it? I mean, and, and could people buy it? And Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah, it, it's I, kind of like 
<laughs> I'm sorry that this topic really like interests me. We'll go back onto topic soon, but because <laughs> because like the reason why um, I find this fascinating <laughs> is because the reason why I like type is um, I like to explore like the conceptual boundary that you can bring type to. Like I'm, um, I think that there's so much more we can do with type, and and it's in the sense that like mm -hmm. like how much can you test your your natural um in, like um starting point like how much can you flex from that starting point and that fascinates me and this mm -hmm. was why yeah. this is so interesting to me and yeah, so I think type i think type yeah. is going to show itself in process though not necessarily just in the end result of um of a role i mean i've seen a lot of actors work at like the, is watching just their their process to get to a certain place is is fascinating i've done a little acting I can't turn my face off. I can't open my eyes in an SE dominant kind of way. So I'm limited probably in the types of roles that would that would fit. Um, but look at Al Pacino. I mean, if 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 uh, if ever there was an INFJ, Joyce, it's it's Pacino. And to see the variety of roles there um, is, you know, see, and that's a funny, that's a funny one too, because we always connect acting to FI, or a lot of times we do, because there are so many FI dominant people who get into acting because that just that process of reproducing an emotion is just there. At the same time, we all have FI, even if it's in, even if it's not in the, in the preference stack, you know what I mean? So it's that, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's development. Yeah. Really cool thoughts, everyone. And so back on topic, <laughs> um, any other, <laughs> like, so, my question for you all is like, what is a question you would ask someone to determine whether or not they're ISTJ or INTJ? Let's say like you 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 know that they're ITJ, but you just don't know if they're an ISTJ or an INTJ. What question would you ask to figure out their type? And maybe we can like test that out to see if it actually works with <laughs> INTJs and ISTJs in this panel. <laughs> if you need to get around a rule of some sort, if you need to break a rule to get to to get to some goal, how do you go about doing it? Hmm. Break a rule to get to a goal. Um, I probably try to do it as non-discreetly as possible for the most part. Um, I don't know if that's a enough of an answer or not. But like at work, if there's something, if there's a rule in place that I think is stupid and it's getting mm -hmm. in my way or it's making something take longer than it should. I mean, I'm kind of in the fortunate position that I'm mostly 98% of the time I'm working by myself. So it's it's usually as simple as just disregarding the role. Like, I, I know what I'm doing, so I don't have to worry about the stupid procedure because the stupid procedure doesn't make any sense. And it really should be changed. So it's kind of that kind of thing for me. It's kind of like a, it's a cost to, it's like punishment to, effectiveness reward if, if it's low punishment and high effectiveness uh, there's a good likelihood that i'll probably break it if it's high punishment and high effectiveness I, i'll probably take pause on it because i'm really not interested in facing consequences so typically high consequences will usually deter me from breaking a rule so you went to te there so i think mm -hmm. i might there might there yeah. probably a lot of overlap there too yeah maybe not a great question like what kind of rules should be? Yeah, I was kind of, um, I was kind of yeah. thinking, I was kind of thinking, thinking a very similar, similar train of thought. You know, it's kind of all, kind of weighing, you know, wh what kind of results can I get? You know, versus what what the consequences are going to be? Are 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 people watching me? How easily can I get away with it? And you know, if it's something where, you know, like, like, like some superior that's enforcing the rules is watching me like a hawk, then, then I might have to resort to, you know, trying to explain why, why I don't think the rule is a good idea or, or maybe looking for some loophole in, in, in the rule where, well, it doesn't explicitly state that you can't or, or you could interpret it like this. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe try to get around it that way. So when, when I'm trying to determine between, the two there's usually three main things that I'll go go for I'll, I'll I'll shoot for trying to figure out what the weaknesses are because usually for me it's easier to peg a weakness than a strength so I'll try to more or less try to peg them off whether they have inferior NE versus inferior SE 
And then beyond that, I'll look for what, what kind of information they tend to use when, when giving an explanation. If, if they like to delve really deep into this is exactly how I got to where I got, that, that usually tells me there might be more of an SI thing going on. If, if it's more of a, uh, if they avoid explaining it, that's usually a good sign that there's NI involved. If they just kind of jump to an answer and they don't really give any kind of explanation as to why they got to that answer, that usually tells me there's mm-hmm. intuition kind of at play, specifically more kind of the okay. NISE type could it, thing. Could it also be? Could it also be like having like a thinking function low in the stack? Like, um. So like the, the thing with the thinking function being low in the stack is usually there will be other factors coming out. Like, if the thinking function is low, usually you'll see a lot more emotion coming out in the language that they're using in the way that they're talking or the way that they're typing out their messages. So it, that kind of rolls out the low thinking function for me usually because I'll pretty quickly see that they're using feeling pretty heavily. For me specifically, I actually usually in my typing sessions, um, I actually do what Ryan does where he said, um, I focus more on the weaknesses if I'm going to test someone specifically with sensing and intuition. But sensing and intuition is also the very last thing I check for in any session because I'd rather see how they're responding to every other question that I've asked them throughout the session and in the way in which they're giving those answers. And to me, that intuitively points me towards whether they're more likely um, an intuitive type or sensing type. And Joyce, as you've gone through the certification problem, um, sorry, problem, process, you probably also maybe do something along the lines of image association. I also do image association um, tests when I'm working with individuals because I believe that that's a valuable way to glean how they're perceiving something upon first interaction with it. Yeah, really good points, everyone. So how I tell apart SI and NI in, in my typing sessions is that I listen to how much they put their own personal experiences into their answer. So it's the the main tell is um, the SI users do this process, which I call contextualization, um, or you know my friend Dan calls it this. He says like SI users, they when they're explaining something to you, they'll provide the context of everything. So they'll say like they'll provide all the details of the situation. Basically, SI users when they're answering a a question, what I noticed is very consistent among a lot of them is is the referring back to personal experiences. And that like, I don't really ask a lot of S or N dividing questions, but throughout the interview, it becomes very obvious whether or not like it's an I or SI based on how they talk about their personal experiences throughout the session. A good sign that um, Chris mentioned is is the image associ- association. So that's something that you could use too to figure it out. So basically, in in the official MBTI, they have an exercise, um, and basically, they flash an image on a screen for like ten seconds, and then they ask you, "What did you get out of that? Like, what did you see out of that?" And basically, within these first ten seconds the sensors are more likely to notice like the fine rich detail of the image, whereas the intuitives will go like, um, this was showing me the meaning of existence itself and the grand galore of reality and how it dances with, I don't know, our understanding of metaphysical. That would, that would settle the issue. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they say that you can't flash the image for more than 10 seconds because um, after a while, the opinions start bleeding into each other, but that initial impression that people get is very telling of whether mm-hmm. or not they're sensor or an intuitive, basically. Man, I, I hate those ink blob things. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at them like, it's a blob of ink. What am I supposed to get out of that? It's so all I see is blob of ink. <laughs> <laughs> This is not meant to penetrate deep into my psyche. <laughs> oh, this is just a blog of ink. <laughs> I don't have any repressed, you know, sexual fantasies or, <laughs> you know, because I interpreted the blog of ink this way. <laughs> that, would be, that would be my first. Uh... <laughs> I was just, um, 
I was going to say that I think that the interesting thing with the intuitives is that they're almost desperate to find meaning, even if there is none. And I yes. think that's the most important mm -hmm. thing when you're talking about image interpretation mm -hmm. and association is they will often tell you, though, I mean, they, they might come up with like a concept, but the more the, the intuitive dominant types will often tell you is something akin to like a story. Sometimes they'll be able to pull some sort of like what's happening in this image, despite if there's no actual detail to explain what that really is. And to me, that's quite interesting. Yeah, that's ten thousand percent true. <laughs> I can't imagine saying what what Ryan said, like that it, it's just a blob of ink. It wouldn't just it just wouldn't it wouldn't come to my mind. And I'm not the I mean, if I'm being honest, I'm not the least nihilistic person out there, but I'm still desperate to find meaning. So like I I'd have to like I'd be anxious until I could spin something out of it. And and the thing is like. That, that might be an NI and NE thing too, because like NE, I've seen them do improvisatory exercises and it's just, it's, it's staggering. I'm like how just one thing after another, you know, where I'll, I can get into a panic if, if like something's not coming up, it's like, I'm looking for something here. I don't know what it is. And the heart starts racing a little bit until, until you find it, but things just don't spontaneously just start, you know, rattling themselves off for me. I, yeah, intuitives, they have a problem with trying to create meaning out of thin air. So even when there's like what Chris said, even with there's no meaning, like we'll try to create a meaning that's not even there because we it's got we're kind of looking for like something, some some sort of underlying meaning like it's 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 a compulsion. It, it's almost like we can't not do it. I think Briggs summarizes it the best in Gifts Differing, and I, the quote's going to be probably butchered here a little bit, but she says something along the lines of the introverted intuitives, that they view reality as a prison in which escape is urgently necessary through some subjective understanding of the situation. So essentially, they're trying to escape the mm -hmm. present moment by finding meaning within it. That is so true. <laughs> and, and so that's another difference between INTJ and ISTJ. So, like, is, is the person more likely to like abstractify everything they see <laughs> than maybe INTJ. If they're more likely to see the grounded reality, probably ISTJ, so. Can I add that just in general, there's two, there's two, I get along with ISTJs very well. There's two areas where we butt heads. <laughs> One is when it's a rule enforcement issue. When it comes to like, like Ryan was saying earlier, when it comes to like, breaking or circumventing a rule or a process that we agree is just stupid, then we're the best allies, the INTJs and the ISTJs. If there's a disagreement there and it's the ISTJ enforcing the rules, there's there's a lot of, there tends to be a lot of conflict there. And uh, the other one is like, I don't, there's a lot of times when I don't like expect to be taken literally. And there's a lot of times where I'll really just like spin off into some place that just, I'll get this look from ISTJ sometimes, like, what is this nonsense <laughs> that you're spit that you're spitting out right now? So those I think connect to the last conversation, but those are the two the two areas where, you know, I can frankly it's me annoying the ISTJ more than <laughs> vice versa, probably. That is so true, Michael. The look that ISTJs give you when what you're saying it's, it's brutal. Like, what's what's the matter with you? Look. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten that before. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. Do you guys find that people complain about you not giving enough context? Is that something that you find with having dominant NI happens? I will at work because it'll be, I, I want to get to the thing that we're doing. Like, no, this is the, here. Here's, here's a little information. This is what we need to be doing. And I want to push through and just get, get to work on that because sitting down and going through meeting after meeting over and over and over again, and going back through all the details to prove that this is the thing that we need to be doing. And it's like, it, that, so I'll, I'll jump to it too quickly, just from the perspective of, you know, needing to persuade everybody that this is what we need to do and getting everybody on board. There, there's an impatience there. It's not that I won't do it the other way, but I get impatient about it. It's definitely like that for me as well, where it's something along the lines of like, because I never had like a management role, but I was, I worked at a place for like five years. So by the time that I was done there, I was the most experienced in the position. So I was in charge of giving people duties for the day. So I would give people duties and I'd go, okay, why am I doing this? And I'd say, well, just, just do it. Like, 
I don't need to give you all the details why you need to go do this thing. It'll be the best if you go do this thing. I don't want to have to explain the whole process to you. Whereas my manager, who was an ESTJ, this whole store manager, he he loved to just like sit down, have a 30 minute meeting, explain to everyone why they were going to be doing everything for the day. And it's like, all right, could have summed this up in like 20 seconds. But Okay, I, I feel like I need to revise the question a little bit. Like, I, I agree with you in those kind of circumstances. I, I'll kind of be in the same boat where I'll just be like, I just want you to do this. And I I just want to get to it and get it done. But I, I meant more in a, when, when you're trying to, when just like holding like a casual conversation or when like explaining something to somebody in, in like a, not in a teaching sense, because in a teaching sense, you would you would be sure to give context, but like just kind of in more of a, I guess, more of a conversation sense. Do you find people on the other end are like confused because they're missing context because you didn't give them as much context as they seemed like they needed and you thought they were following and they ended up not following or that that's kind of more of what I was getting at? I definitely think that I have that problem communicating with people because I often will sometimes assume that when I'm having a conversation with people that they may already know kind of the details. And I'll, when I get to the point, then they're just kind of lost, especially if I'm like trying to teach uh, something to someone like my wife struggles with that. I'll, I'll be like, oh, it's kind of easy. Why don't you understand this sometimes? And I'll catch myself saying that and be like, oh, no, that's a bad thing to say because not everyone has the experiences. Um, or in, even like in video games, I do this thing where like I just kind of like to jump in and start learning and intuitively begin to grasp the controls. And I have friends who I'll be like, all right, you're ready to play? And they'll be like, no, I have to go through the whole training mode. I have to find all the details and the context for the thing we're going to be doing. And then we can do it. And for me, it's like, no, I just want to kind of get get to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for myself, it, it, it's kind of being more on the receiving end, end of it. I, I kind of feel like people aren't always giving me enough con me enough context. I, I work I work in a library and you know I'll have customers come uh, approach me and and they'll ask me a question and and I'm like okay or or they'll think they'll ask me a question but, but to me it's it's not really you know asking a question. For me it's like like okay the, it's some jumbled mess of information and then I gotta 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 ask okay well what 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 is it that you're actually trying to ask me here what what is it that you want me to do or, or what are we trying what are we trying to trying to achieve and and I guess the other person thinks that they've kind of kind of inferred that and and I'm and I'm going like okay okay what are we trying what are we trying to do here but but then I can kind of I can kind of relate to what what, what you were saying to Sir Syk um like sometimes when I'm showing somebody how to do something, I mean, sometimes I mean, I'm not always consciously aware that I'm doing this, but sometimes I will know something so well that, that sometimes I will, I will, you know, omit key steps. Like, like I'm showing somebody in the library how, how to do something, something on the computer. And I'm more likely to say, okay, you're going to go to this website and then you're going to click on this link. And then once you click on this link, you're going to click on that link. But then, but then their problem is more just, you know, using the mouse or, or the cursor or clicking on stuff to begin with. So then I got to, you know, and, and for me, it's like, I don't think about that because for me, it's so, I guess for me, it's so obvious. I would add that from, from, the perspective for NI for NI, there's a sort of perspectival sense. So I feel like if I'm, unless I miscalculate that I have a sense of the amount of information that someone else needs. So even if the impulse isn't there to, to give all of the information, then I, I, I would generally hope that I do have a sense of what needs to be conveyed or, but then it, see, it goes to TE so fast because it's like what needs to be conveyed to, even if it's just getting a story across, it's like, there's a goal there, you know? Uh -huh. when, when I'm interacting with an ISTP, uh, Mara, the, the, my partner on the blog, I tend to have the problem in the opposite direction with her. So I will lose her because I gave, too much context so because she's dealing with like a completely opposite stack she's just looking for a specific piece of information and then i basically drown her in the details so i will i'll be like 
ineffective in communicating, but like in the opposite direction. I'll give too much information versus not enough, at, at least with her anyways, because she'll get frustrated sometimes because I'm like, no, I got to give you all the context so you can understand exactly where the point's coming from. She's like, I don't need the context. I don't want the context. I just want the point. Just give me the point. Strip away all the details. I totally so, agree with that. Yeah. I, yeah. I 100% agree mm -hmm. with that. Don't drown me in details. I don't know what to do with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also agree with that with NI. I don't actually provide enough detail because mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm explaining something, I'm more focused on articulating to you the takeaway I got from it, which is the underlying meaning. And I expect you to add up the add up the details yourself to understand why I got to that underlying meaning. And so what I'm guilty of is, so basically this is what my ENFP friend says I do. She's like, Joyce, this is what you do for people. You're painting an aquarium for people, but you're going like, here's the seaweed, here's the, here's the rock, um, here's the water. You're going to, you have to yourself put together this by yourself. And so it's basically, I'm giving you the takeaways and these takeaways should hint to you what went into it. What I'm trying to say is I expect other people to infer the dots. <laughs> yeah, so I can leave out context because I, I see it as something that you might find satisfying to do for yourself. And it's also hard for me to <laughs> explain it too, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But I think it's even harder for me to explain it because I share I share Mars two functions, NI and TI, which you guys labeled as like the most abstract of the introverted functions. So they can be hard to explain, Brian. Definitely. Yeah. We, we, we struggle in communication on that, on that level a lot because she'll, she knows a ton of stuff in her head, but for her to like try to articulate some of that, just like to bring it down into like actual language to communicate it to me. Um, yeah, that she definitely kind of struggles in that sense. But it's, it's interesting because it's kind of like when you work with somebody for so long, you start to kind of, you get a feel for them. So then you don't always need them to give you as much of the actual language for it. And then you can kind of start doing some of the inferring, like you said, that you expect people to do. And, and that's kind of the beauty of that is when I started being able to do that, then I started to be able to articulate some of the things that she was not able to articulate because I'm coming at it from my perspective and I'm like, oh, well, I can put words to it. Yeah, and that's why I appreciate extroverted intuition. What I notice is I'll say a vague statement and extroverted intuition will be like, do you mean that? Do you mean that? Do you mean that? And eventually the NE user will get closer and closer to what I'm trying to communicate to the point where they they understand at some point. And I can appreciate that. It's a good compliment, which is, is what I'm saying. <laughs> And so, yeah, so, so, so Ryan, I'm kind of curious more about, you know, the dynamic between you, you and Mara. I mean, I mean, do, do you find it that it's often challenging because, because, you know, in that, in, in, in that, you know, front stack of cognitive functions, you know, your, your top, those top four cognitive functions are all opposite each other. Do you, do you, do you often find it challenging or do you see it kind of more, you know, like like complimenting each other like like you know you, you can give the other person what what, what they don't have and, and vice versa for, for the two of us it's it's pretty complimentary i mean obviously there are moments where we're literally talking past each other because one's trying to say one thing and the other person saying something else and you find out later that person was stuck on a point three points ago and i'm over here talking about i've moved on to something else and and you're arguing or discussing two different things and then you're like you're not making any sense and then there you're like you're not making any sense and then you back it up and then you find out you were literally talking past each other so i mean stuff like that does happen but i do feel like there's there's a lot of complimenting going on just because it's kind of synergistic in the sense that you have all different pieces and then if you can get them to work together it works really well yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think your website, you know, and, and your YouTube channel, you know, it ends up being a higher quality in the long, long run, but you're kind of covering all the bases because you, you have the opposite set of cognitive functions. So. I would say it definitely helps. I mean, she's helped me a lot with just giving me the perspective from her set of functions that I mean, I probably wouldn't have had 
um, without that exposure. Because I mean, people can sometimes tend to get locked into their own perspectives and viewpoints and what they're deriving from their own set of functions. So you leave that to itself without any outside influence and you can definitely get a lot of bias coming in. Yeah. And so Ryan's website with Mara is amazing. It's called Practical, Practical Typing. And you should go check it out if you guys have time, which you guys do. So go check it out. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming on, you know, for giving your perspectives. I feel like we we got to some really good you know, points in this session. I, I appreciate UI's TJs being able to, you know, replay memories in such, you know, vivid detail and being able to use that to create like better present or, or future type of scenarios where it has these qualities that you really like from, from previous experiences that you're able to maintain and upkeep the parts of the experiences that you do like and bring them back and recreate them in ways that benefit people and benefit you guys. It's it's a really big service you do for the world. And so thank you for using your superpowers and like bringing it into the world and being able to articulate your your thought process and your cognitive stack so well. Like it was a, it was a pleasure <laughs> to listen to Michael you're laughing at my Effie. <laughs> I love I love your outros. I love it. I love it's yeah, I love it. Yeah. And so thank you, INTJs, for just the, <laughs> the ab abstract wonders you bring to this conversation. You're able to, you know, bring this talk into a very, very, <laughs> like, like you, you guys bring a really interesting angle to the conversation. You guys, with your TE, you're able to, like, like aim from A to Z to find, like, like, clear differentiations. Like, you cut to the chase and you do it really well. And so like, thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you INTJs too for your, <laughs> Michael, you're laughing at me. I'm sorry, no, 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 it's, it's, yeah. I love the compliments, please. <laughs> I'm choking on this bit. And, and so thank you INTJs for your ability to remember the meaning of things, you know, or, or to, 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 to kind of like analyze and figure out the meaning of things, you know, you INTJs are able to, you know, decipher the world and decipher the human, con the, de decipher the human condition or decipher like some sort of wide abstract concept that helps better the world. And you guys are, you know, really great at that. And that's an amazing strength you guys have. Um, and so I really appreciate that. Michael and Azure Psych have amazing INTJ channels. They, you know, curate top-notch quality. And if you want to be wowed by content, check out also Ryan's channel too, by the way. He has a, he has a YouTube channel now too called Practical Typing. These channels are just exceptionally well-produced. And I highly some recommend. Of the, can I just, I just want to add some of the best, most concise definitions of functions on Ryan's website and on the YouTube channel. Everybody should subscribe to that. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the clearest, most practical. Yeah. I, most I concur. I concur. It's a, it's a great website. Yeah. And, and, and I love that you're, that you're also putting a YouTube channel up. That's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, Ryan, you and Mara's like work is like so well done. Like just the execution of it, the 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 quality of content, the the ability to shorten down like abstract concepts into a very practical way is like superior to like a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So like thank you for that, Ryan. And thank you, Laura, for, for coming on. And <laughs> you, you came on with such a short notice and I really appreciate that. And you're, you're very clear with articulation. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. <laughs> yes, and I, I enjoy our talks, Laura. You're a very fascinating individual. <laughs> oh, thank you and, very much. Yeah, and so thank you everyone for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, our talk and I appreciate, you know, the wonderful perspectives you all bring and I appreciate you guys as individuals. So thank you. <laughs> I'll see you all. Yep. Thank you too. Yep. Thank um, you.
thank you for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. And <laughs> bye, y'all. <laughs> bye, guys. Thank you.